I can tell right now this class is going to be trouble, all right? So this is a much more serious class than apparently the one you've been part of, so. Yeah, the teachers are the worst students is what I heard. Yeah, okay. Hey, if you have a Bible, I want you to take it and go to uh, Book of Nehemiah, Chapter 2. We are studying the, the Book of Nehemiah from a chronological perspective, Chapter 1 all the way through to the end. And I want to remind you again that all of the, these studies are online. They are videotaped. They're on YouTube and on Vimeo. And uh, we're also going to be providing the outlines electronically as well. We do have the previous week's outlines up here in this box. If you'd like to uh, go through that, we would appreciate that. Uh, we are very, very excited. And I, sa- I said this earlier, as this building is going up uh, outside, it's not a coincidence at all that we're studying about a leader who was part of a building project. And so the vision is for us to raise up leaders in the house of God. That's God's plan. That's God's heart. But as we prepare for the next level that God has for us, we need a lot of folks to step up in leadership. Please somebody say amen. Amen. And so uh, we're glad you're here tonight. This class is truly open to everyone, and uh, we appreciate that. If you are a leader in the church and you have not been able to be part of all of these, uh, that's one of the main reasons we're providing it on video is so that you can keep up in other ways. Okay, here's what we've learned so far. The first thing a leader does when presented with a situation is they, they pray. And then last week we learned the second thing a leader does is They plan, all right? So we talked about the prayer life of a leader and learned that from Nehemiah. And last week we talked about how a leader plans and plans ahead. And uh, and today we're going to talk about how a leader makes a presentation or more specifically, how do you motivate other people to get involved in what you have, in, in your vision, in your leadership? How do you motivate people? So how do you get people to cooperate with you? Because how many know success in leadership is never a one-man show? If you're going to be successful in leadership, you're going to have to get others on board. You're going to have to motivate some folks to come alongside you and help you. Now, there's a lot of different uh, ways that you can apply these biblical principles. Uh, We talked about, obviously, first of all, in ministry. If you are in ministry leadership, you are leading or or influencing folks in in a spiritual leadership capacity, obviously, you can apply these. You can apply this in a business setting or or a corporate setting or marketplace, wherever you work. Uh, You can apply this at home, uh, in in your area, whatever you're involved in, these biblical principles can help you. And so whatever you choose to do, if you want to be successful at it, then you're going to have to motivate some people to go along with you. Let's start with chapter 2. We're going to start with verse 10. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal wall and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there wasn't enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up, to the, went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, Because as yet, I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let's start rebuilding. So how many know success? Nehemiah was successful at getting everybody on board the project. He leaves, he leaves uh, Persia, where he is the king's cupbearer. He's second in command in a pagan nation. He, he prays. God gives him a burden and, and direction concerning rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. The king gives him money. The king gives him timber, sends a cavalry guard on the with him, goes back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. And uh, he's, now we see Nehemiah is motivating others to get involved in the project. And they say, all right, let's do it. 
Verse 19, but when Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshev, the Arab, heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us, saying, what is this you are doing? And they asked, are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. I love that verse. So much, let's all say it out loud together. The God of heaven will give us success. Nehemiah says, we his servants will start rebuilding, but as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for all of these wonderful friends that are gathered here tonight. And God, those that are watching electronically, Lord, we pray that you would bless this time of focus on learning leadership. God, we pray you'd begin to reveal to us how we can apply these things in our lives so that we could have success. We pray the same prayer that Nehemiah prayed. God, give us success in what you have placed in front of us. We pray, God, open our eyes that we would see wonderful things in your law tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's give a little background here because uh, Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem. He goes back to this city that had been devastated, had been invaded, had been deserted, had, had been destroyed, and he finds people who are defeated, who are apathetic, and basically they're living among the ruins of a broken down city and broken down walls. Now I want you to understand that twice before, uh, in the last 90 years, people had tried to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and they failed twice. They were 0 for 2. Okay, when it comes to this particular project. And so for, for 90 years, these people will be saying, it can't be done, it can't be done, it can't be done. Anybody ever gone to a church like that? <laughs> I mean, that, that does sound like some churches. We can't do that. You know, it, we've tried that before. It didn't work. And so that's what happened. And so how did Nehemiah pull it off? Why was Nehemiah successful when the other two efforts weren't successful? Well, the reason is he was a great leader. And he knew how to get people on board in the process, how to motiv motivate other people to get involved and, and, and to motivate them. Now, let's talk about why you need to hear this. Well, you need to know how to motivate others to get involved when you're promoted to a new job. Let's say you're at your employment and you get a promotion and now people are working for you. I mean, you should learn how to motivate other people, right? Uh, other than I'm going to fire you right? Uh, when you need to uh, introduce change in, uh, let's say, your house, in your family, your church, your ministry. How about when you want to get something new going? Uh, maybe God gives you a vision for a ministry. We've been talking about ministry, <clears throat> excuse me, and gifts. Okay, I want, to, I want to activate my gifts. I want to step out, and I want to do this. You're not going to be successful by yourself. You're going to have to get some people alongside to help you. So how do you do that? Okay, that's what, that's what we're going to learn from Nehemiah. How do, we, how do we motivate other people to get on our team? Here's number one. And it's quite exciting. Expect opposition. Now watch this. The moment you say, let's do something, someone else will say, let's don't. You know, when God's people rise up and say, let's build, Satan's people rise up and say, let's oppose them. And that's reality. People, here's the reality. People are naturally resistant to change. People are drawn to the status quo. And uh, status quo is a Latin word for the mess that we're in. <laughs> now, people resist change for a lot of different reasons. And we're going to talk about those over the next few weeks. But leaders are people who figure out what those reasons are and, and addresses them and deals with them. Let's, let's look at verse 10. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Now, Nehemiah doesn't mince any words here. He, he just automatically exposes them. These folks are ticked off because we're trying to help people. Okay, And so he names the two leaders in the opposition. There's Samballot, who is the governor of Samaria, and Tobiah, the leader of the Ammonites. So these weren't just citizens or people who were living there. These were the leaders, the governmental leaders of the area. Now I want you to notice that he hasn't even arrived in Jerusalem, and already there's opposition. Okay, He hasn't even gotten to the place and even told anybody what he's going to do, and already people are ticked off at it. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Verse 8, Paul says, I'll stay here at Ephesus. There is a real opportunity here for a great worthwhile work, even though there are many 
opponents. So Old Testament, New Testament, 2013, the principles are the same. Wherever there is an opportunity, there's going to be opposition. There is no opportunity without opposition. When you are going to change the status quo, when you're going to change a situation, or you're going to try to change people, you can expect opposition. It's going to happen. And so the second thing that Nehemiah does when it comes to motivating others, he waits for the right timing. He waits for the right timing. Now, when you're motivating other people and suggesting change, timing is everything, right? Have you ever had a good idea that was killed because of bad timing? Have you ever had, well, we could do this, and it just, the timing wasn't right. There are a lot of great ideas. There are are a lot of great visions that never come to pass because the timing was wrong. Verse 11, Nehemiah says, I went to Jerusalem after staying there three days. Now watch this. This is pretty amazing. He gets to Jerusalem, and he goes to his house, and he does nothing for three days. That's pretty amazing. Nehemiah has been praying about this thing for four months, we learned earlier. He goes to the king, gets permission to go to Jerusalem. He gets all the resources. King sends a guard with him. He gets, you you would think he would have a plan or have a thought, when I get there, I'm going to do this. But the Bible says he doesn't do anything for three days. It's not a grand entrance. There's not a white horse that he rides in on. There's no trumpets, no fanfare. He doesn't walk in the gates of Jerusalem and say, here I am to save the day. Now get to work, you goobers. Is that what he says? No, the first thing he, I want you to notice the first thing he doesn't do is get off his horse and start putting bricks and mortars together. The Bible says he waits. He didn't even announce why he was there. He didn't do anything for three days. Now, what was he doing those three days? Well, there's four, four possibilities. Uh, he was probably resting. Remember, he's recovering from a long journey of 800 miles on a camel. I'm guessing he could be resting. He may have been praying. Okay, remember, he had never been to Jerusalem before. Uh, he most likely was planning, reviewing his strategy. We talked about that last week. And I think we may need to consider perhaps he was building curiosity. He arrives, think about this, he arrives into town, uh, there's a few people with him, including the king's escort, into a town that's defeated and discouraged and down and out, okay? So immediately, he goes to his home and says nothing for three days. Now, don't you think that created some curiosity? Don't you think there was some whispering going on, what's this guy up to, you know? He, He got the king's cavalry with him? What's going on? He, he's just, he does nothing. And how many know people's curiosity can get the best of them? Like, what's going on? By the time three days go around, they're like, you got to tell us why you're here. For three days, the speculation grows and grows. And, and I think Nehemiah may have been using the delay for his advantage because when he presents his proposal, he's got everybody's attention. Everybody's paying attention. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 7, there is a time to be silent and a time to speak. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 6, there is a right time and a right way to do everything. Timing is a big thing when it comes to accomplishing God's will. Timing is a big issue when it comes to getting people on your team. Now listen, if you're going to be part of changing a situation or seeing a vision come to pass, you have to wait for the right time. How many times did Jesus say in the New Testament, People would say, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that. And he would say, it's not the right time. It's not my time. Uh, I'll never, a lot of pastors get in trouble uh, because God gives them something. Or maybe they go to this event and God speaks to them. And the very next Sunday, they're saying, we're changing everything. Now, don't raise your hand if you've ever gone to a church like that. Don't raise your hand if I've ever done that, okay? But a lot of churches get in trouble because the pastors get so excited and get so charged up, you know, and and they realize, wow, there's some things I should do different. And they don't don't wait for the right time. They just jump right in with both feet. I'll never forget, years ago, uh, uh, we are at Tommy Barnett's pastor's school in Phoenix, Arizona, and God speaks to me about giving $50,000 to the Los Angeles Dream Center. Now, that was back when we had about 200 people attending our church. (laughs) Yeah. 
And so I was like, okay, Lord, I'm going to wait for the right time. That was about February. The right time happened to be about July of that year. And uh, I've told this story many, many times. We didn't receive 50000 It was over $80,000. It and was, it was probably one of the more notable miracles in the history of our church. Now, the real, my point is that part of getting to the place that God wants us to go is waiting for the right time. Are you getting that? Nehemiah shows us that. Okay, here's the next thing that Nehemiah does. Uh, and what we need to do to get other people on board is to get the facts first. Get the facts first. Now, how many of you have heard of the midnight ride of Paul Revere? Well, we're about to see the midnight ride of Nehemiah, okay? Verse 12, he says, I set out during the night with a few others. I hadn't told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. So Nehemiah, he's sneaking out at night. And I wonder, why, why did he go out at night? Well, the Bible says he's inspecting the damage to the city. He's, he's, he's taking an animal and he's riding around seeing the, the damage for himself. Remember, he'd never been there before. He hadn't grown up in Jerusalem. And so he had heard about this and God had given him a vision for this and God had given him a burden for this, but he hadn't seen it for himself. How many know Nehemiah is doing his homework? He's getting, it, he's getting a, an understanding for himself. He's, and, and this is the part of leadership that, that's not very glamorous. This is the part of leadership that not a lot of people talk about. It's called preparation. It's called getting the facts. It's called work. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, the Bible says there's so much rubble here that he can't even ride through it. He has to get off his animal and walk through it. And, and, and the size of the project starts to settle in on Nehemiah. This is a big project. This is a huge deal that we're about to undertake. It's worse than I thought. Now, verse 16, the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Now, why is he being so secretive about this? Can I, can I tell you? It's because he didn't want his plans to be stalled right out of the gate. You know, 90 years of negativism can add up. Right, can have its effect on people, and, and, and he didn't have all the facts yet. He could have stood up and said, hey, this is what we're going to do, and, they, and, and, but, and because he had done all of the homework, because he said he, he walked around by himself, he inspected it, he knew what the uh, opposition was going to be. Now, how many know, is it easier to promote a good idea or kill a good idea? It's easier to kill it right? And so Nehemiah has taken very concer good concern about promoting his vision. By the way, did, did you, have you ever noticed that negative people tend to be more vocal than positive people? Don't confess your sin, I'm just saying, right? Negative people tend to be more vocal than positive people. And leaders got to understand that. Leaders have to recognize that just because it's loud doesn't mean it's a lot, Right? Nehemiah knew that. And so he says, before I announce what we're going to do, I need to get all the facts. Here's a leadership principle uh, on your outline. Leaders protect their plans from premature death. Leaders protect their plans, their vision from premature death. People want to knock it down. People will want to kill your dream. People will want to, to dismiss what God has given to you before it ever starts. And so Nehemiah is protecting it. He's waiting for the right time. He's getting all the facts. And so we have to, we have to use wisdom in those things. I'm, I'm sorry all my stories are about offerings tonight, but that's how it came. It must be the building thing. I'm not sure. Rewind way back when, uh, the first year that Tracy and I had started here at Grace, the church had a debt of $23,000. And God spoke to me when I was in a meeting with somebody who said, we're going to pay that off in one day. Okay. And, and there were about 60 people attending back then. Okay. Apparently, the smaller the church, the bigger the miracle. I'm not sure how that works. But God, but God gave me a vision and, and a strategy for doing that. But again, I didn't announce it the next week. I, I, I thought, because what I was asking people to do was to give 100% of their income for one week. And the reaction was a lot like that. <laughs> but I was thinking, okay, here's some strategies, here's some ways. And, and I bounced it off a few people so that when we made this announcement, we're like, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this, you can do that. Oh, okay, yeah, I can see how we do that. 
Leaders get the facts. Leaders do their own research. Proverbs twenty two twenty three. get the facts at any price and hold on tightly to all the good sense you can get. Some of you need to write that on the door frame of your kid's room, right? Get the facts at any price, hold on tightly to all the good sense you can get. Proverbs eighteen thirteen. what a shame. Yes, how stupid to decide before knowing the facts. Proverbs 14, 15, only a simpleton believes what he's told. A prudent man checks to see where he's going. Can I get an amen, Pentecostal people? Right? Good leaders do their own research. Now, I want you to watch what Nehemiah does here. He understands his opposition. He creates curiosity. He researches all the facts. Now he believes the time is right, okay? Now he's ready to lay his cards on the table. And in verse 17, he says, then I said to them, Okay, then so now Nehemiah is ready to share the vision. Nehemiah is ready to let the cat out of the bag. This is why I'm here. This is what we're going to do. But I want you to see what he does in verse four, how he does it. He identifies with the people. He identifies with the people. All good leaders do this. All good leaders identify with the people that are serving with them. Right. I am one of you. I am not above you. I am one of you. Verse 17, I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come let us, notice the words he's using, rebuild. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. Right? He doesn't say, look at the trouble you're in. He says, we, Kimosabi, <laughs> right? It's us. Now, he didn't walk in as an outsider from a foreign country, and he's the king's second in command. So this guy's got some, he's got some presence to him. He's got, some, he's got a look to him. He doesn't come in condemning, or, or, or he says, you guys are a bunch of miserable failures. You just let the pros come in and do this job. Is that what he does? No. He, listen, when you blame other people, get this, when you blame other people, you decrease motivation. But when you accept blame and responsibility, you increase motivation. Oh, this is a revelation for a lot of you right here. Because if you walk around blaming everybody for why you don't have success, you're just going to be repelling people from helping you. But if you take responsibility and identify yourself with the problem, people will say, hey, I want to help you. I mean, no, humility will go a long way in getting people to help you accomplish the dreams that God has given to you. And so he says, I'm one of you. This is our problem. This is our problem. So good leaders identify with their people. Now, by the way, this is good for parents as well, right? It's a lot better for you parents to identify with your kids rather than to rule them with a rod of iron. I mean, you're going to get a little better response from your kids when you take time to listen, right, and to identify and try to understand. I'm not saying be their friend, but take time to understand why they're doing what they're doing. That was totally free. Here's the leadership principle. The best ideas are not mine or yours, but ours. A lot of we, a lot of us identify with people. Number five, here's what Nehemiah does. Nehemiah embraces the present realities. He embraces the present realities. So what Nehemiah does is he doesn't mince words when he talks about the problems. Matter of fact, he does the opposite of minimizing the problem. He dramatizes the problem. And he gives them the bad news first. He, he, he says, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruin, and its gates have been burned with fire. And he goes, we need to do something so we'll no longer be in disgrace. Do you, do you see? I don't, I'm not sure if, if uh, Nehemiah went to thespian school or whatever. But he's dramatizing this a little bit. We're in disgrace. This place is in ruins. Those are, those are harsh terms. But the reality is, they were all correct. He doesn't gloss over the situation. He paints a picture of the present realities, but I want you to notice, without casting blame on them. So he's not ignoring the trouble. He's not ignoring the problem. It ain't that bad. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna fix this thing in 52 days. Now Nehemiah says, this is bad. This is really bad. This is, this is, this is ruined. And God's name is disgraced over these things. Why does he do this? 
Put yourself in, in their shoes. These guys have been living in this mess for years and years. And it's a fact of life that the longer you live with problems, the more you're going to ignore them. Right? How many times have you ever had something break in your house? In the first one or two weeks, it bothers you. But after six months or so, you don't even notice it anymore. <laughs> right? You're just kind of used to that toilet handle deal not working. I'm confessing my own sin, all right? But, but it happens, all right? And so uh, when you live with a situation long enough, you can become apathetic to it. And so Nehemiah recognizes that he is dealing with, the pe with people who are used to living in ruins. Some of them were born in it. Some of them knew nothing different. This is their life. This is what they expected. This is what they knew. And so Nehemiah refocuses their attention on the problem. We've got a mess. We've got a problem, and he's trying to get them to face the facts. Now, how many know you're never going to get anything to change until people face the facts? Nothing's ever going to change until you face the facts, until the people that you need their help face the facts, because change never occurs until people become discontent with their current situation. If you want to have change at your house, if you want to create change where you go to school or in your office where you work, or if you want to create change in the ministry, you've got to create discontent. Now, this kind of explains why you should expect opposition, <laughs> right? Because when you begin to upset the apple cart and you begin to paint a, a harsher picture, some people do not like that, all right? It may be a mess, but it's my mess, baby. Right? And so he, he creates discontent. Now, one of the marks of a leader is the ability to create discontent without casting blame. Okay? Now, if you don't want to change anything, you won't be discontented. Now, let me give you another illustration. Years ago, our church, uh, as we began to grow, we began to notice there were some, uh, there were some, uh, uh, we began to notice that there were, there were some people saying, I can't get connected. Everybody there has a friend and, you know, and, and they would come for a while and they would say, we love it and the services are great, but then they would end up leaving. And, and we started to hear whispers like, you know, uh, there, there's not enough opportunities for fellowship or we just can't break in or something like that. And so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm slow. Okay. And, and, and so what we did is one of the things we did, we, we hired a consultant to come in and basically just measure some of the different aspects of the church, one of which was fellowship. And so when we did some of the assessments, here's what he says to me. And remember, we're paying him money for him to tell me this. He goes, your fellowship is in the toilet. He goes, it's not just bad. This is one of the worst I've ever seen. I still get upset when I recall that conversation. Now, this is a nice man, but I didn't think so at that time. But you know what the reality was? He was right. And guess what we did as a result? We launched small groups. We made a major change in our church, a major change in our schedule, which was not easy. That we had had Sunday night church forever and always since Jesus was born until Jesus comes back. But we had to face the facts. And we had to come, to come to terms with some discontent. It's not okay for this to continue. Are you with me today? And so the mark of a leader is you got to shake up the status quo. This is why a lot of churches get plateaued. This is why a lot of ministries get plateaued, because they don't want to upset the apple cart. But listen, you're not going to obtain the vision that God has for you until you're able to paint a different picture. Okay? So how did he do it? How did he motivate these folks? Well, he appealed to their self-esteem. He says, listen, guys, we're a disgrace. The city's torn down. The walls are torn down. This is not good. He says, we can do better. We can do better than this. This is not who we are. This is not who God has created us to be. Right? And I, want, I, I think this is a breath of fresh air to these folks who have been living in this mess for all these years. Here's somebody who finally speaking the truth to us. He's not just tickling our ears and just patting us on the back, telling us everything's going to be okay. He's, he's a realistic leader, and he's not blaming us, but he is addressing the problem. So he appeals to their self-esteem, and more importantly, he appeals to their concern for God's glory. He says, not only were the Jews being disgraced, guys, God's name 
is being disgraced. Now, who are these Jewish people? Well, they were God's people, right? And the whole world was laughing at them. And God, you Jewish people say your God is the God of all gods. And guess what? You guys can't even rebuild a wall around your city. You're vulnerable. You're a laughing stock to everybody around you. You're living in rubble. And so Nehemiah appeals to the fact that God's name is being defamed. Now, I want you to notice he doesn't use external motivation here. He doesn't say, okay, now, Nehemiah, he says, now, the first one to rebuild the section of your wall gets an all-expense paid trip to the Red Sea. Right? Or the first one that does this gets a $50 gift card to Lowe's or something like that. He doesn't use any kind of external motivation. Now, how how many of you know that the older you get, the less those kinds of motivations work? That kind of stuff works well in kids and teenagers. That's why when you do vacation Bible school and things like lift off and things like, you know, we do around here, when we say, well, you're going to win a free iPod touch. You know, if we did that here next week, there'd be a big fat, whatever. Been there, done that, don't need any one of those. Got too much electronics in my house anyway. Are you right? So he doesn't appeal to external motivation. Here's the leadership principle. The greatest motivation is not external. It's not even internal. The greatest motivation is eternal. He says, let's build the wall for the glory of God. Let's rebuild the wall for God's sake, for God's name's sake. That's motivation. He's challenging them with a right kind of motivation. He's not challenging their pride. He's He's not challenging them through a guilt trip. He's saying, let's do this for God's glory. That's awesome. No wonder they got behind him. So what do you do when you're trying to motivate change? The next thing you do is what Nehemiah did. You ask for a specific response. If you're going to get people to join your team, you got to ask them something specifically. You don't just get people excited, get them stirred up, and then do nothing. It's kind of like a lot of churches. They have some great services. Boy, that was great. God was there. That was awesome. Now what do we do? We'll go home and come back next week. Well, I'm preaching now, right? And we do all of our spiritual life on Sundays and Wednesdays and wherever we go to church. That's not the plan at all. The purpose of those things is so that we will go and do what God has called us to do, right? He doesn't just say, hey, we've got a mess. He doesn't just say, you know, let's have a big rally and this will go home. He says, we've got a mess. Now let's rebuild the wall. Here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to help me rebuild this wall. And so he asked them specifically to help him do that. Now I want you to notice that Nehemiah is both realistic and optimistic. And that's something that, that's a balance that good leaders have. The balance between realism and optimism, right? He's realistic. He faces the facts. He takes the midnight ride around the city. He lets the seriousness of it weigh him down, how bad the place was. But he's optimistic when he says, the God of heaven's going to give us success. Do you see the balance here? He, lo- he lays out the problem. He doesn't cover it up. He doesn't gloss over it. But he also doesn't say, this is impossible. Let's go home. He says, let's do it. Let's don't give up. Let's rebuild. Here's another leadership principle. Leaders are both real. L- leaders see both the real and the ideal. Leaders see both the real and the ideal. You know, they not only see what is, Leaders see what can be. Leaders are gifted in seeing what is, the present realities, but they also see what can be, the future possibilities. Now, a leader who only sees what can be and doesn't pay attention to what is, is just a visionary. And we call those people pie in the sky. So heavenly minded, they're no earthly good, right? All dreams. Some people call them, they, all they want is happy talk, happy talk, happy talk, happy talk. No negative around here. No negative. All happy talk. It's all going to be okay. A leader who only sees what's real, but never the ideal, usually that person's an accountant. (laughs) I'm sorry. That was free. Uh, If you're an accountant, I'm sorry. You just tune up. It's the way it is, man. It's bottom line, 
<laughs> God bless you, counts. You have a role in this world. Place in this world. All right. Leaders, look at what is actual and what is possible. And when you bring the two together, the people who see the present reality, but the people who anticipate the possibility, you have good leadership. Do you agree with me? To get from the real to the ideal, though, you have to have help. If you're going to see change from the harsh realities to the future possibilities, you got to get people on your team. You got to motivate other people to help you out. And so leaders cannot be afraid to ask for help. You can't be afraid to ask for help. And we've talked about this on Sundays for the last month or so, right? One person can't do it all by themselves. It takes an army of people to help out. And so does anybody here like asking for help? Nobody really likes asking for help because most of the time leaders are insecure and will say, you know what, I'd rather just do it myself. You know, rather than take the possibility that somebody's going to reject me, somebody's going to tell me no. We talked last week about sometimes we say no for other people before we're ever at. They're just going to say no. So I'm just going to do it myself. But listen, if you're going to see change happen, you got to ask people for help. More than uh, a little over three years ago, you know, we... We cast the vision for building the building that today, in the last three days, we've seen go up, liggity split. But you are crazy if you think that just happened a few weeks ago. All right? Guess what we had to do? We had to ask for help. We had a capital campaign. Now, I'm going to just go ahead and tell you, I don't like asking for help. I'd much rather say, is there another way? <laughs> Then to ask for people to come alongside and sacrifice and, 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 and do what so many did. You know, I'd rather not, I'd rather not do that. But listen, the wall around Jerusalem is not going to happen until somebody stands up and says, folks, we got we to gotta work hard. We got to sacrifice. It's going to take some blood and sweat and tears and energy and money and time. Now listen, our buildings don't get built until somebody stands up and says, we got to do this together. We've got to sacrifice in order to get to the next level. Now, those of you that were part of the ask, those walls outside, it creates a little different level of tingle in your spirit. Am I right? Because you understand you're part of that and you were, you were part of that sacrifice. And, and that's awesome to be part of. Leaders ask people for a specific response. Okay? Stop trying to do everything yourself. Ask people to help you. Okay, number seven, uh, number seven. Now, if you, again, here's what Nehemiah does to encourage people to get on the team. Encourage people with a personal testimony. Encourage people with a personal testimony. Verse 18, he says, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. I want you to notice this is one little verse, but it's very important. Remember, Nehemiah includes it in here. He says, this is how God called me to this project. I didn't ask for this. I was praying. God gave me a burden. And the more I prayed, the burden turned into a vision. And I said, okay, God, I'll do it. I'll go to Jerusalem. So God is the one who called me to this project. God said, okay, that's his testimony. God told me. Now, part two of his testimony is that there were some circumstances that confirmed what I just said. He says, I went to the king and asked his permission. And guess what the king said? He said, yes. Yes. The same king who earlier ruled, those walls could never be rebuilt. He reversed course and said we could do it. And by the way, he's paying for it. <laughs> he sent a guard with me to protect me on the way to get here. And uh, he's going to provide all the timber to make it all happen. Now, by the way, it's a legitimate question to ask somebody when they say, God told me. And by the way, a lot of people do that way too much. Well, God said, God told me to do this. Now listen, when somebody comes to you and says, well, God told me to do this, it's a legitimate question to say, um, can you confirm that? Are there any circumstances or people around you that will confirm that God said that? That's what Nehemiah does here, right? Uh, is anybody confirming God's call on your life or God's vision in your life, are there any signs that this is actually true? 
You can ask this. You probably should ask this is what I'm saying. Nehemiah shares his testimony. And, and I want you to look at the people's response. They said, let's rebuild the wall. In 90 years, nobody has been successful at getting the people to do anything. And in three days, Nehemiah rallies the entire city. And they are on board. Let's do it. Let's rebuild the wall. He comes, and because of his leadership, the people will get behind him and complete the project. What happened? What happened in those three days? Don't miss this. The vision that Nehemiah had is now transferred to the people. It's their vision. It's no longer just Nehemiah's vision. It's their vision. First, Nehemiah says, it's my vision. I guarded it. I protected it. I didn't tell anyone. I waited till the right time. I got all the facts. I embraced the reality. I asked for a response. Here's what we need to do. And then I share a testimony and encourage them that God's in this. And here's how we know God's in this. And, and they bought in. Now, here's another leadership principle. People follow people, not programs. People follow people, not programs. And what do we call the people that people follow? Leaders. Good answer. The people that people follow are called leaders. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. Now, when's the last time you said that to somebody? When was the last time you said, you know what? Watch me. Watch my life. Watch how I live, watch how I talk, watch how I interact with people. That's how you're supposed to live. That's what Nehemiah was saying. Follow me. Let's do this. And the reality is people are going to follow you when people can see the hand of God in your life. When do you know that you're a leader? When are you ready to be a leader? When people can see the hand of God in your life. You real, uh, If... If you can't see God's Spirit working in my life, in your pastor's life, don't follow me. You, you shouldn't follow me. But listen, if you see God's hand in my life as the leader, then you should do everything in your power to get behind what God is doing at Grace Assembly of God. Are, are you with me? Now, I'm saying that because this is what Nehemiah says. Listen, it, the, the only test of leadership, the, the test of leadership is not how much education you have. It's not how much talent you have. It's not how many spiritual gifts you have. There's a lot of people with talent that you should not follow. There's a lot of people with lots of degrees behind their names. Uh, they have more degrees than Dr. Fahrenheit. But that doesn't mean that you should follow them as well. Listen. Does God have his hand on your life? If he does, people will follow you. Come on, somebody. You can be from the sticks of who knows where. You can have this story, that story, this testimony, that story, that testimony. It does not matter. The, the reality is, is God with you? If he is, people will follow you. People follow people, not programs. Here's the last one, number eight. And so how do we get people on our team? Answer the opposition quickly and confidently. Now we're going to get a lot more into this the next couple of weeks, how a leader handles opposition, how do he handle conflict. But verse 19, when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us, saying, what is this you are doing, they ask? Are you rebelling against the king? Now, the first thing you notice, what's the difference between verse 10 and verse 19? In verse 10, there were two guys opposing him. And in verse 19, there's a third guy. First it was Sanballat and Tobiah, and now you got the third guy who is Geshem the Arab. Now the point is, opposition usually grows the more a project continues. It's not going to go away. The opposition to your vision. When we get further uh, into the book, we're going to see that how, how the enemy attacks us in different ways in opposition. But their first tactic is mocking and ridicule in verse 19, okay? They, they, they mock, the Bible says they mocked them and they ridiculed them. You know, those Jews will never get that thing built. You guys are nothing. You guys are trash. You haven't done it in 90 years. You know, just all kinds of name calling, all kinds of, of, of character assassination. And then they say, watch this, you're rebelling against the king. This is an illegal thing that you're doing. 
Now, before we dismiss this, understand that this excuse had been used before in the book of Ezra, chapter 4, verse 13, and it had worked. The people go back to the king of Persia and say, hey, these people are trying to rebuild the wall. The king says, you got to stop doing that. And uh, so the project got stopped. And so, but this time, that accusation or that, that attack didn't work. Why didn't it work? Because Nehemiah was a good leader. And look at what he says in verse 20. I answered them. I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Now watch this. How did he answer the opposition quickly and confidently? He refused to argue with them. This is huge. This is huge. Do not argue with people who oppose you and or God's vision in your life. Don't argue with them. Well, yeah, huh? No way. Yeah, huh? No way. Yeah. If you're wise, you're not going to argue with the opposition. But watch, watch what he does. Instead, he points out, this is God's idea, not mine. He says, this is not about me. This is not about what you think it is. This is about God. God put this thing on me. And since it's God's idea, guess what? The God of heaven is going to give us success. And then he exposes their real motives. He says, why are you doing this thing anyway? Why are you opposing this? Because he understood that they had a stake in this, in this, uh, in this because if the walls were rebuilt, then the size of their influence would shrink. This wasn't about the king of Persia. This wasn't about anything other than, than them, right? And how many know, my dad always used to say this. I heard Tommy Tenney say this too. In the church, the issue is never the issue. The issue is always control. Oh, I just opened a can of worms and I wish I had time to talk about that. But we got to realize the issue is never the issue. The issue is always control. Now, Nehemiah responds by not arguing with them. He says, this is God. This is not me. And you need to check your heart because of what's really going on. Don't argue with people tit for tat. Don't, don't go back and forth. All you're doing is elevating their status, right? Forget them and do what God's called you to do. Well, that's good preaching, all right? Now, his response, no, 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 they, watch this. They said, you're rebelling against the king of Persia. And Nehemiah says, really? Let me show you something. He pulls out the letters. The letter from the king of Persia, who said, rebuild the wall. Who said, cut down the, the, cut, cut down the timbers from my royal forest, all right? Give Nehemiah everything he wants. Uh, sorry, you're wrong. I'm not rebelling against the king. I'm obeying the king of kings. And I'm going to add this part. So shut your mouth. <laughs> he probably didn't say that. I would have said that. He probably didn't say that. Nehemiah's response to these people who, I mean, think about their character. Beating people down, attacking their character, assassinating their, their, their character. Nehemiah's response to these guys encourages confidence in the people of Jerusalem. We got a leader. He's standing up to these dudes. He's saying something. He's, you know, we've been defeated for years and years, and here's a guy who's not afraid to stand up to these bozos. I want you to notice that people will always follow people who are willing to stand up to the opposition. Far too many times, God puts visions in people's hearts. And they go to do them, and they get opposition, and they quit. But can I tell you, the more you endure, the more people will follow. The more they'll get behind you. Come on, somebody. People are looking to follow, follow others who will stand up to opposition. 1 John chapter 3, verse 13. Don't be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. Now, if Jesus said it, I'm thinking it's true. Leadership is not a popularity contest. If you want to have all the friends in the world, if you want to have everybody in the world like you, don't go into leadership because it's not going to happen. You're going to ruffle some feathers. If you start working for God, you should expect some opposition. 
Anybody who does anything for God is going to experience accusation and ridicule. It's going to happen. Matter of fact, the only way to not be criticized is to do nothing, say nothing, be nothing. And probably still then you'll get criticized for doing nothing, saying nothing, being nothing. (laughs) If you decide, listen, even if it's just deciding to live for Jesus, I've decided to follow Jesus, you can expect there's going to be some people who ridicule you and they'll laugh at you. You're doing what? You're not going to do what anymore? You go to church how many times? You give how much of your money to the church? Are you crazy? You just let them laugh. Let them go on with their opposition. Let them go on with their accusation. Because listen, people will question your motives just like they question Nehemiah's motives. It's part of the price of being a leader. They said, Nehemiah, who do you think you are? What are you trying to do? Build your own empire back here in Jerusalem? We know what your motives really are. Nehemiah says, guys, it's not about who I am. It's about who God is. And it's about the vision that God's given me. Now listen, we, we here at our church, we have a vision. We have a vision that God is going to put us in, in, in a position to minister to the greatest number of people possible in these last days. We have a vision to reach this community for Jesus Christ. And how many know if we're going to reach them for Jesus, they need a place to park? Right? We can just say, well, what's going to happen? No, we need to prepare. We need to be ready for what God has called us to do and what God has called us to be. So, listen, it's not up to us to set the limits on what God wants to do in his church. It's up to God to set the limits. It's up to us to say yes. I mean, if I was in the right church, you'd all be shouting by now. It's awesome. That does not mean that people will not oppose you because they will. People will oppose you. And when they do, here's what you do. You respond quickly. And you respond confidently. And you respond humbly. It's not about me. It's about God in me. It's not about my name. It's not about this church. It's not about this vision or this ministry. It's about the vision that God has placed in my life. And you know what? People will get behind that. Somebody put it this way, kites rise against the wind and not with it. Pretty awesome, huh? Now, let's, let's apply this. Let's bring it down, down to you, okay, and in your life. How do you apply these principles? Let's start out in, in the workplace where you work, in, in your business or wherever your employment is. Let's say you get promoted, Okay? And now you're in a position where people used to be under folks and now you're over folks. Okay? Now, Nehemiah shows you the, the right way to move into that responsibility because Nehemiah goes from the guy serving the king, the guy ultimately responsible, to being the guy ultimately responsible. And so if that ever happens to you, follow Nehemiah's principles. He shows us how to move into a position of authority with wisdom. And so uh, what about your family? Let's say... You're just not really happy with the way things are going with your family. Uh, if you're going to see change in your family, guess what you should expect first? Opposition. Probably from your kids. Oh, we don't want to do that. You know, kids, we're going to do that. This is our new schedule, and this is what. Ah, ah, ah. You know, there's going to be opposition. And so we're going to have to be careful to uh, wait for the right timing. Get the facts. Face the harsh realities. Paint a picture. Are you with me? Give them time to receive it and identify with them. Don't talk down to them. Identify with them. All right, I'm preaching good, all right? And so talk about your family in us terms, in we terms. The Murrays do this. This is not about me. This is about us, okay? Uh, what about ministry? If you apply these things to ministry, Let's say you want to start a new ministry. You got a vision. You know, God just stirred you up. You got a vision to do something for Jesus. And, uh, or let's say you're leading a ministry that, that's, that's been kind of stalled or stagnated uh, for a while. What do you do? Well, you do what Nehemiah did. You expect opposition. You wait for the right timing. Right? You don't just start 
blabbing off everything that God's told you. You, you test it. You pray about it. You plan. Then you face the facts, right? You're thinking it through. You're anticipating the obstacles. You do the research about it. You identify with people. I'm not here to tell you what to do. You know, uh, I'm not the consultant. I'm the team player. And then you embrace the present realities. You got to be realistic. This is going to be a tough job. This is not going to be easy. I mean, no leaders don't lie. Everything's going to be a breeze. No, they're saying this is going to be hard, but we can do it because God's going to help us. Ask for a response. You got to have a plan of action, okay? Uh, I need your help. Ask them to help you. They'll help you. And then encourage them with a personal testimony. Nehemiah tells a story. God's blessed me. And this is the circumstances that confirm it. And so the people rally together. Because the reality is people love to be led. People are hungry for good leadership. People are hungry for somebody that will put their needs before their own. Jesus said the good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. That's what makes a great leader is a person who recognizes that, that, that God is with us and there's a vision that's, that's going forward. And, so, and then you answer opposition quickly and, and confidently. You don't argue with people because there are some things that God will want to do in your life and other people aren't going to get very excited about it. And so you have to trust the Lord and trust Him to bring it to pass in your life. Somebody say Amen. Now, I've left, a, uh, I've left a space for you, but I've not left any time. So I'm going to ask you for 60 seconds. There on your outline, there's a question at the end that says, what is God saying to you about this? Would you take 60 seconds and write that down? What is God saying to you? How are you going to apply this in your life? If it's just one tiny little thing, that'd be great. There's a lot to deal with here, a lot to think about here. But just one, maybe one action point, one thought. What God, what, what's God saying to you? Take a moment and write it down. Now, God, we pray that you would give us a heart like Nehemiah. Lord, as leaders, we understand that this is not a walk in the park. It's not easy. But God, we know that you promised to help us. So, Lord, we pray that you would come alongside us and strengthen us. And God, if there are issues in our life that needs to change, in our homes that need to change, or where we work or where we lead in ministry. God, we pray you'd create the holy discontent in us and help us, oh God, to, to be part of that vision and to cast the vision. I pray for all the ministry leaders here tonight. God, you give them favor. <clears throat> give them favor with others, even this weekend in the ministry fair. Bring people alongside them that will lift their arms and assist them in accomplishing the vision that you place in their hearts. And together, God, we want to be part of what you're doing in these last days. Use us. Help us. Strengthen us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. You're an awesome crowd. God bless you. Have a great evening. We have extra outlines up front here if you'd like to grab those.